Well, good morning, beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. It is so good to see all of you out on this bright, sunny Sunday day. It's just a good day to be here and a good day to be together. Thank you so much for coming out. Your decision to be here indicates that you are committed to the two greatest commandments. Love your Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind by joining together to worship Him. And to the best of your ability, loving one another and to be loved by one another as you gather with your brethren to encourage and share a fellowship with one another. So thank you so much for choosing to be here. We have folks visiting with us. We're glad that you're here. And hope that everybody will take an opportunity, take this opportunity to meet them and get to know them and spend some time with them. I may make a little hint for those who are visiting. If you want to meet folks, stay in the auditorium. This is an auditorium group. Uh, some groups go out in the foyer or go outside, and others stay in the auditorium and, and chat and mingle and visit with one another. Uh, la last fall, I taught uh, Wednesday night Bible class at uh, Round Hill, and my wife was not obligated at the time, so she came with me. And after the first couple of services, she said, you know, these, they don't stick around and talk. And I said, no, honey, they go outside. You know. She stands inside. She's used to staying inside the auditorium and visiting with people and, and everybody's around and you go back and forth across the auditorium and visiting with people. And at Round Hill, as soon as services are over, they all go stand outside. Now, you, you want to visit, go stand outside. They're all standing out there talking. In December, on a Wednesday night, I'm sitting out there, I got bundling up, freezing to death, but they're talking, they're visiting. So, so, Take it, stand around, stay around, and here in the auditorium for a few minutes. But we do need, to, I think, in, in light of what was talked about in class this morning, it's not a bad idea to have a couple of folks besides the preacher shoot out to the auditorium, uh, to the foyer, to trip people who uh, before they can get out the door. <clears throat> Excuse me, to, to to catch people before they can get out the door. Yeah. Because typically here, when people hit the foyer, they're headed out. So you got to stand out there and, and get in their way. Stick your hand out and make them stop and shake your hand. Well, anyway, I hope your Bibles are open to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, because that kind of leads into our study this morning, in a way. Because I want to ask the question, are you a cowboy? Now, I don't mean, are you a fan of the Dallas Cowboys, NFL's Dallas Cowboys? Nor am I asking, do you ride horses and wear cowboy hats and go on roundups? Now, I have to confess, I am a lifelong Dallas Cowboy fan. I, it's in my blood. I, no matter how despicable Jerry Jones is and how disappointing their mediocre, their decades of mediocre teams have been, I still bleed silver and blue because of that. I was born and raised basically in the, the kind of in the extended shadow of Texas Stadium and Tom Landry and Roger Staubach, and so I just, I just can't help it. As much as I'd like to, I can't help it. But I am proud to admit that I have been around horses most of my young, uh, life as a kid, especially. I had horses. I was at, at one point actually even thought about uh, going rodeo cowboy route with, uh, as a calf roper. But my horse wasn't any good, and, and I didn't have the money to, to do that. And then I got 150 horses in the form of a 1966 Ford Mustang, and four legs was just not enough anymore. So forget about all that nonsense. But I will have to say, I did have a good friend who owned a ranch in, in eastern New Mexico, and I went out and spent several days with him one year uh, doing um, rounding up cattle, riding horses out there, and I still had my saddle and my chaps and my rope. So I got to rope some, do a little rope in there. But that's all long in the past and really kind of irrelevant. Because that's not really the point of the question, are you a cowboy? To understand the point of the question we need to understand how the Europeans use the word cowboy when they talk about Americans. You see, to a European, when they call Americans cowboys, they're insulting us. To them, cowboys are seen as rebellious, gun-toting, ignorant rednecks. They are the worst stereotypes of unpleasant people who are always fighting with everyone around them because they can't get along with anybody because they will not be told what to do. My wife and I were watching a TV show the other night, a cop show, and, uh, and they were trying to pull somebody over, and my wife got so aggravated. said, what is it about guys? 
Sir, step out of your car. What? Me? Who? Why? What? You know, arguing with everybody when they're, they just don't want to be told what to do. Now, I bring that up not to just comment on American cultural stereotypes or even European snobbery, but to introduce the next part of our series here in Colossians, which is preachers like Paul from Colossians 1, verse 24 through chapter 2, verse 3. Do I have your attention? Are you wondering, where's he going with this? Probably are. I hope so. Well, it's simple. There is a cowboy mentality in American Christianity that is pushing a lot of young religious people to European-style authoritarian traditionalism, to ancient religious organizations like the Roman Catholic and the Greek Orthodox churches. It is a, a phenomenon, seriously enough, that there have been a lot of books and articles written about it in the last few years. Recently, I read several articles lamenting how Gen Z kids are part of a sizable group of people leaving the churches they grew up in, in large part because of their chaotic, freewheeling, shoot-from-the-hip, cowboy-type worship. I even read one article saying it's happening among churches of Christ. And I think that's quite true. In fact, I've told you all about this Ohio preacher and his wife that I follow on Facebook. And they're, they're weather vanes for current church trends because they are driven by their emotions. Last year, one of their kids converted to a Greek Orthodox church, and rather than explain why that was a bad decision, they wrote several Facebook posts on the virtues of the Greek Orthodox church. And the two main virtues were its authoritarianism and its long-standing traditions. So then when I read these articles recently, it hit me. Their son left the Lord and the church because his parents are cowboys in the worst possible way. They are unstable and rebellious, gun-toting, spiritual rednecks. They shoot from the hip and they react instead of acting on the basis of the gospel. Instead of being anchored in truth, such as, as, as preachers like Paul are, they are children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, as Ephesians 4 verses 14 and 15 talk about. Instead of strength of character and um, a relentless spirit of courageous service to God and to His people, they are the worst stereotype of instability and irrationality that's been mocked by our disdainful European cousins. Their son was de desperate. He was seeking to maturity, and he was desperate for stability and consistency and found it in an organization, an unscriptural organization, organization, rather than in the gospel and rather in the church where his dad was the preacher. Now, in fairness... Many young people are put off by authoritarian traditionalism. And they don't like tradition-bound churches. And they will go and leave that for the freewheeling, make worship a party kind of mindset. That happens as well. So I'm not saying the solution for the people who are seeking traditional traditions and stability is to become rock fed, you know, like, uh, stuck, in con you know stuck in concrete. You know what concrete is? It's firmly mixed and thoroughly set. Or thoroughly mixed and firmly set. It's not going to move. But we're not, that's not the solution. Because the fact is, Satan is going to find uh, what you like and offer it to you. If you don't want, if the person who does not want to serve God, who does not want to be faithful to God, is going to find something that they think is better than serving God. And so the solution isn't going freewheeling, nor, the solution is, nor is it sticking into a tradition that you're so bound by that you can't hardly move. That's what sets congregations like the Lilac Road Church of Christ and other, Lord's, uh, other churches of the Lord apart, is their stability through strength of character and a relentless spirit of courageous service to God aided by preachers like Paul. Certainly not perfect men. Absolutely not. I is one, so I know I'm not. I know that's not the case. But people who are persistently passionate 
for God and for his people. Men who, along with their godly wives, are committed to being preachers like Paul. And in order to give this text, this, and that's what Paul is talking about here in Colossians 1, verses 24 through chapter 2, verse 3. He's describing his ministry. And there are several things we can draw from the text. And I, just to do justice to it, we're not going to be able to spend, uh, we're not going to be able to cover all of it this morning. We're just going to actually divide it into three parts. The first part is serve the church. That's what we're going to look at here in verse 24 this morning. The second part is that we're going to get to next week is manage the mystery. And you saw the word mystery in the text, so you see where we got that. And just look for the word stewardship if you want to know where the idea of manage comes from. And then the third part is fight for hearts. So preachers like Paul serve the church, manage the mystery, and fight for hearts. And that's what we're going to be covering here in the next three sermons that we preach. Now, uh, the first Sunday in December, Dennis is preaching. I'm going to be out of town. Dennis is preaching. We'll stick, get back to this you know, that following week. So, what does it mean to serve the church? That's what we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning looking at. What does it mean to serve the church? Well, let's start with the word that's translated minister. And I want you to notice in the text, going back to the text that Kevin read for us, I appreciate, Kevin, the, the good job that you did, especially at last minute notice. Um, we had a lot of people out today, and uh, so anyway, we're glad that you were able to do that. Why don't you notice at the end of verse 23, and at the beginning of verse 25, Paul brackets Verse 24 with this statement, made a minister. Look at the end of verse 23, of which I, Paul, was made a minister. There he's talking about the gospel. He was made a minister of the gospel. He was a servant of the gospel. And then in verse 25, of this church, I was made a minister. Because in verse 24, he's talking about his service to the church. So he brackets verse 24 and the discussion of what's going on in verse 24 with this idea of his work as a minister. And so what does the word minister mean? Well, minister basically means uh, a servant. You know, and it's a shame, really, that, that the world has become that the word has become an official title carrying worldly power and weight. Think of it this way: instead of just being a minister, a servant, many preachers are caught up with the prestige of being the minister. This is our minister. Y'all are saints. This is our minister. Here's our minister. Now, Dennis, I know I can tell you, isn't caught up in that, and I hope that I'm not either. That's what happens. It gets to be a mindset. Our word, the word minister, our word, English word minister comes from Latin and it means to serve. It just means to serve. That's the idea. And the word deacon and uh, the word minister in, or servant in Greek is deacon or diakonos, which uh, get, we get deacon from. And we're familiar with that word. And it's the idea simply of a servant, one who carries out the commands of another. So somebody who's doing what they're told by somebody else who has the right to tell them what to do. That's not a power. That's not uh, glo someplace, something to gloat about. It's a place of service. Doing what others need at the instruction of somebody else, and in particular, the instruction of God uh, in particular. Now, on the one hand, it is fitting that the word which means servant became attached to one who leads. You know, you talk about the minister, and especially in English countries, they'll have the minister of finance and the minister of this or that. That's the person that's in charge. And it's, a, it's fitting that it's okay that that word is used for that in that sense because it is attached to someone who leads because true leaders are servants. They're serving. If you're going to be a leader, and Jesus is all over this in the New Testament, if you want to be first, serve. If you want to be first in the kingdom, be a servant, be a slave. But on the other hand, it's a shame that so many see the title as a way to power and prestige. That's why Peter had to warn elders not to forget that they are servants first. Go back to 1 Peter chapter, or flip over to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Paul has to warn elders, men who are going to be and have oversight over the church, who are selected by the church for that, by the way. They don't appoint themselves, they're appointed by the church. And there's an, I'll make a point about that in a moment. 
They may not be called deacons because there's a distinction between a deacon, the office of a deacon, and the office of an elder. But elders better be servants. They better be deacons in the sense of being servants. They are not rulers. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 3 says, Therefore I exhort the elders among you, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd or pastor the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for solid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples to the flock. Every church needs godly men who can serve as elders. But any church that is appointing elders that has elders needs to remind those elders that even though they are submitting to them, the elders serve as servants, not as rulers. They have to have, be reminded they have limits. And if they refuse to accept those limits, it is imperative for the church to remind them of those limits and if necessary, remove them because of their failure to observe those limits. It's not easy. It's not pretty. Typically, it involves division, especially when elders dig in their heels and insist, I'm in charge. You better submit to me. As effectively, I've heard elders say recently, shut up and submit. They knew the word shut up, but said, you have to submit to me. And you are not allowed to discuss these issues. And churches divide because of that. Now, the same principle applies to preachers. Preachers are not in charge. They are not the boss. They don't get to tell everybody what to do. Sadly, most churches today, uh, denominational churches, call the preacher the pastor. It's, the, it's their common official title, and it's their badge of authority, and it's unbiblical because most of them are not pastors in the official sense. That the Bible talks about a pastor. Remember here in 1 Peter chapter 5, shepherd the flock. It's the word pastor. It's referring to someone who is selected as an elder. You know, it's interesting that married Peter was identified as a fellow elder, but Paul was never identified as a fellow elder because he was single. He was not qualified, and Peter would have been serving somewhere as an elder of a church. Again, this is a reminder about serving under Christ, serving the Lord, serving his people, not oneself. And this was a task that Paul was uniquely called to do. Look at Acts chapter 9. Look at over in Acts chapter 9. Paul received a call to preach, call to be the apostle of the Lord, in a very unique and special way. The Lord appeared to him on the road to Damascus and had some instruction for him. And so he was called, but he was called not to be the Apostle Paul, he was called to be a servant. Verse 15 of Acts chapter 9 says, But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. So that's his job. He has a job. He's going to be he's the instrument. He's a fork or a spoon or an axe or a knife, or whatever you want, just an instrument in the hand of God to be used for God's purposes. That's why Paul called himself a servant of the gospel and a servant of the church back in Colossians chapter 1. But notice verse 16, where he points this out. He says, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that takes us back to the next part of, Corinthians, of uh, Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. Where he says this, and let's read verse 24 again. It talks about he was of which I, Paul, was made a minister of the gospel. Verse 24 says of Colossians 1, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. 
of which or of this church I was made a minister. So he's talking about the church there. He is suffering for the church. He's making up for the afflictions of Christ, the afflictions of Christ that are lacking for the church. What Paul is doing, he's describing his attitude of rejoicing or of joy in the opportunity to suffer for you. Not just the church in Colossae, which he never met, but the church in Litchfield, which he never met. He suffered for us. And it's the idea here, of, it's the, word of, the word is passion, which means intense emotional feelings that are typically associated with the experience of severe pain or hardship. So when he says he's suffering, it's, the, it's literally the Greek word passion or pasho. Uh, it's, it's where we get our word passion from. And it's the idea of these intense emotions driven by a very painful and difficult situation. And so Paul is saying, I am happy to go through this intense emotional pain and this difficulty and this, this uh, hardship for you. Notice again in the text, for your sake, verse 24. My share on behalf of his body, which is the church. So that's what Paul is willing to do. He's willing to suffer what he was, whatever it took to serve God. Now, when we read this, what we understand is that Paul's not saying here that, that he had to suffer to make up for some lacking in the, the, the atoning work of Jesus. That somehow or another, the blood of Christ was insufficient on the cross and that uh, the Catholic Church has to do the Mass every Sunday to continue that, that sacrifice or, or we have to suffer somehow or another so that the sacrifice continues. That's not what he's talking about there. The blood of Christ was sufficient. He died one time for all. All right, so that's not what he's talking about. What he's talking about is that the world wants to hurt saints. But more importantly, they, the world wants to hurt Jesus. The world hates the Lord first. Look back in chapter 9 of, of the book of Acts. Go back to chapter 9. Uh, and there was a text, uh, part of this discussion or inter interaction between Jesus and Paul on that road to Damascus. And I want you to notice what the Lord said to him. So Saul's traveling, he sees a light, he falls down, and verse 4 he says, And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Let me ask you a question. Is there any record of Paul being there with the Sanhedrin when Christ was crucified? No indication that he was at all. Nothing to say that. But he says, why are you persecuting me? And, and that's, a, that's, an, uh, that's a present tense now. Why are, not why were you, but why are you? What, who was Paul attacking? The church, the body of Christ, the people. And so what he's talking about here, in verse, uh, then in verse 5, he says, and he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. So when we persecute God's people, when we harm God's people, we're harming Christ. And so the world wants to harm Christ. The world cannot stand the Lord. The world does not want Him as their Lord. And they will take out their, their frustration at their inability to get their hands on Him, on you, on His followers, on His believers. And that's what Paul is talking about there in Colossians 1, verse 24, about in his body, making up for the afflictions of Christ. Paul was the focal point of attacks against Jesus for the gospel's sake, and he was happy to do that. He was joyful in that process. You know, and, and, and Colossians is written from prison. It's not written from some you know, uh, cruise ship. It's not written from some, uh, you know, some... Uh, Resort on the side on the Mediterranean coast, even though he was in a beautiful city on the Mediterranean. He was uh, Mediterranean coast. He was chained to soldiers. He was a prisoner. He was not free to come and go as he pleased. Look over in Philippians, just a couple pages over in your Bible there from Colossians, in Philippians chapter one verses twelve through twenty. It's interesting how there are people who would do whatever they can to frustrate the gospel, to bring harm to Paul, and Paul says, "I don't care." As long as the God, uh, what their attitude is toward me, as long as the gospel is preached. Verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Again, he's in Rome in prison at this time. 
so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and everyone else. So he's in jail, but hey, guess what? Because I'm in jail, guess who's hearing the gospel? These show, soldiers that are chained up to me every day, and the whole guard is hearing about Jesus, and that's spreading throughout Rome. That makes him happy. And that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. So Paul is actually probably the safest place he's been for a long time, was there chained to a, a jail, uh, to a soldier in Rome even though at any moment they could have taken his life away. But still, he's very safe there because the Jews were trying to kill him everywhere he went. Then he says, these people, because of his condition, people are willing to speak the gospel. Well, Paul's safe. He's being protected. The gospel's being shared. So I'm going to share the gospel. Verse 15, some to be sure are preaching Christ, even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former, that is, those who are doing preaching out of envy, proclaim, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. So they're thinking, you know, if we preach about Jesus, Paul will get in more trouble. And Paul says, bring it on, because gospel has been preached. Jesus is being proclaimed. What then? Verse 18. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. And then he says, verse 19. For I know that this will turn out from my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. So Paul was just as happy as he could be that Christ was being preached, whether it brought him aid or brought him problems. He didn't care as long as the gospel was being preached. And that's what it takes to be a preacher like Paul. Turn over if you go to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians is a very personal uh, um, letter by Paul to the Corinthians because he spent such a long time there and, and poured himself out into them, out uh, for them. And, and they were spending every opportunity. They had people there trying to destroy him. And he kept reminding them, I, I didn't do any of this. I, you guys need to understand, I'm not doing this for fame. I'm not doing this for fortune. I'm not doing this for glory, my own glory. Because there were men who were doing it for that. And they were the ones that were attacking Paul. So notice what he says about these kind of people. In verse 23 of first, uh, 2 Corinthians 11. He's already talked about them in some degree. But verse 23, he says, Are they servants of Christ? So are these guys who are running me down, are they genuine servants of Christ? He said, let me, let, me talk, let me give you some crazy talk for me. Let me talk crazy. And I, the crazy talk is, Here's how you know somebody's a true gospel preacher. I more so. You want to be a talk about being a servant of Christ? I am. I'm more than they are, and here's how you know it. In far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number. And this is before the mob tries to kill him in Jerusalem and before the shipwreck on the way to Rome. He says, five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. We're not going to take the time to go back over and look at that, but that's in Acts chapter 13 and 14. And he's in the city. And, and they take him out and they stone him. They leave him for dead. The disciples are standing around, just don't know what to do. Paul gets up, goes into the city, gets up the next day, goes to the next town and preaches the gospel there. And then when they're through preaching the gospel there, comes back to the city where they stoned him and left him for dead and preached some more. Fame and fortune seekers don't do that. Three times I was shipwrecked. Add the fourth one when you talk about the Acts 27. A night and a day I've spent in the deep. I've been on frequent journeys and dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers from... Are among false brethren. I've been in labor and hardship 
through many sleepless nights and hunger and thirst, often without food and cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is a daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. So when we talk about a preacher like Paul, we're not talking about somebody who's in it for the glory, in it for the money, in it for the prestige. They're in it for the Lord and for the Lord's people. You know, thankfully, we live in a very safe portion of the world that's filled with many advantages. And we have legal protection from abuse and attacks. We have a codified promise in our Constitution of non-interference by the government. We have the money and, and ability to build and use comfortable and closed buildings. It's sunny out there, but it's a little chilly. It'd be cold. It'd be a little chilly to be sitting underneath the uh, uh, pine tree or something right now. And we have all the aids that make worship e easy. We have PowerPoint. We have songbooks. We have you know, cups that we can use for the communion that we're going to be using in just a moment. We have these things. The worst thing that we face is angry friends and family who don't like our stand for the truth rather than for their preferred false doctrine. That, that, that's, that is the worst thing that we really have to face, ladies and gentlemen. And it cowers us sometimes. And it shouldn't. Thankfully also, we have men, I told Dennis I was going to embarrass him, we have men like Dennis, who stuck with their commitment to preach God's word, even if it meant low pay and frequent moves with wives who, like Regina, made the best of it, while raising godly children. Preachers like Dennis, preachers like Paul, thank God for them. I can't throw myself in that category because I spent 30 years working in a corporate job. Men like Dennis spent their lives serving the church. There are folks like that all over this country. Don't know how many. I don't know how many in here in, in uh, Grayson County are... Um, I don't know how many in Kentucky. don't know how many in, the, in this country. There are men who like Paul, or who are preachers like Paul, giving themselves. And they love the church enough to keep giving themselves, even though they know that, that as the preacher, there's going to be a little bit of a separation between them and the brethren. Because you can fire the preacher. The preacher can, he's expendable, as my cousin put it. You can get rid of him. But y'all are saying, so if you get tired of me and Dennis, we'll go. You get somebody else in. We understand that. And we understand it too because Dennis and I are the ones who are getting up here on Sunday after Sunday telling you, you know, you need to do better and you need to be better. We're, we're the ones that are nagging you all the time about trying to be better. And so that causes a little bit of separation, but that, the cause of Christ is worth it. Preachers like Paul keep on track. They keep on task. They keep on serving the church. We'll talk about that in more detail when we talk about the gospel managing the mystery next week. Thank God for preachers like Paul, and thank God for brethren who support and encourage preachers like Paul. And that would be brethren like you. You support and encourage men who are serving the Lord like that. Well, that's our lesson. Preachers like Paul. Get your songbooks out. We're going to ask this final question. Will you serve like Paul? The reality is not everybody can be a preacher. <coughs> Not everybody wants to be a preacher. But everybody can be a servant. And it starts with being willing to serve the Lord Jesus Christ with complete and absolute obedience. Willing to do what the Lord says. What about you this morning? Is there anyone here this morning that needs to come to the service of the Lord? whether it's for the first time by repenting of your sins, confessing the name of Christ, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, or if it's uh, you know, having to come back because of failure in your life and weakness. And, not, and maybe you realize, you know, I'm not a very good servant, and I need to get better at it. Maybe it's something you need to talk about to the brethren, let the brethren know, or maybe it's something private. Whatever it is, 
If we can help you this morning be right with God, beg you, please come while we stand and while we sing.